Good evening and welcome everybody to 100 years of Votes for Women. <laughs> I can assure you that's not the last time you have an opportunity to clap at an important moment in the course of this evening, uh, but a wonderful way to start us off. Now, uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeremy Horder. I'm the head of department here at the, in the law department at the LSE. But I have a sort of uncomfortable feeling I should be saying as little as possible, actually, on this particular kind of event. So I will try, um, those of you who know my lecturing style will realize that I'm extraordinarily garrulous at the best of times, but I will try to restrain myself. Um, now, uh, I want to start by introducing our wonderful speakers, three really of the most uh, eminent um, uh, holders of degrees from uh, this university uh, in, that there have been. Um, and the first um, speaker will be uh, Brenda Hale, Baroness Hale. Uh, <laughs> uh, Baroness Hale is a former uh, academic uh, she was a barrister, uh, a law commissioner for England and Wales, and became the first woman um, Lord of Appeal in Ordinary in 2004. She is now, of course, President of the Supreme Court, the body that replaced the House of Lords Judicial Committee, and she holds an honorary Doctorate of Laws from this university, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from her. Secondly, Shami Chakrabarti, uh, studied law here at the LSE before working as a barrister and, of course, made her name, as many of you will know, as the dynamic leader of the organisation Liberty. Um, and she is now Shadow Attorney General for England and Wales. And um, last but by no means least, our very own Nicola Lacey, Professor of Law, Gender and Social Policy here at uh, the LSE and formerly Professor of Criminal Law, uh, a Fellow of the British Academy and awarded a CBE in the most recent honours list. <laughs> now, I, I'm, absolutely, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to... Um, uh, to to introduce these speakers to you this evening. But I do have a little surprise for you before we get going on that uh, particular piece of uh, business. And let me set it up in this way. Uh, Mulberry School for Girls is a comprehensive school in Tower Hamlets in East London and is in the uppermost quintile in terms of socioeconomic disadvantage in this country. Even so, as well as commending the school's exceptional leadership, inspectors have said of the school, students' social, moral, cultural and spiritual development is exceptional. Mulberry girls are highly ambitious, confident and principled. Students are very aware of their rights and responsibilities as young women growing up in 21st century Britain. Now, um, it occurred to me that it would be nice to mark this occasion to invite um, a school pupil to come and read to us a passage from Mary Wollstonecroft's Rights of Women. And um, I sent our admirable LLM student, uh, Gabby Watts, uh, to Mulberry School to judge the competition, which was very popular. Uh, the students who entered are all here this evening, as well as their two inspiring teachers, Joe Latham and Helen Karamalakis, uh, both uh, here at the front. Uh, there was, in fact, uh, a winner of the competition who will be reading out uh, a passage, the passage from Mary Wollstonecroft. But first of all, I would like to invite uh, Baroness Hale to present the prize to the winner, Reswana Anjum, and also uh, a book token to buy some books from the library to her teacher, Joe Latham. <laughs> 
contending for the rights of women. My main argument is built on this simple principle that if she be not prepared by education to become the companion of man, she will stop the progress of knowledge and virtue. For truth must be common to all, or it will be inefficacious with respect to its influence on general practice. And how can women be expected to cooperate unless she know why she ought to be virtuous, unless freedom strengthen her duty and see in what manner it is connected with her real good? Mary Wollstonecraft, 1792, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite the first of our speakers uh, to give her address, Baroness Hale. I should emphasise that uh, it, this will not take the form of a very formal lecture, uh, uh, in which case you would of course have already been sent your reading list, without the case. But um, so uh, uh, the speakers will be giving more in the nature of personal reflections um, uh, of their experiences and their more general uh, views perhaps. Um, there will be an opportunity thereafter to ask some questions. Uh, and in due course, uh, there will be refreshments out in the general area. Um, so without further ado then, I will invite Baroness Hale to speak. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Um, I think all we women understand that we would never have got anywhere without the support of some very good men. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm awfully sorry, I'm not going to say much about myself. In fact, I'm going to say nothing at all about myself. You can ask me questions later if you want. What I wanted to do, and what I think I was invited to do, was to reflect a little on the progress that has been made uh, by women in the judiciary since the vote was obtained um, by a few women in uh, 1918. But getting the vote and being able to stand for Parliament, which is as important a centenary this year as actually getting the vote, and also women got the right to stand for Parliament on equal terms with men. They didn't get the right to vote on equal terms with men. Now, why is that, do you suppose? Well, my theory is that at the end of the war, there were far more adult women than men. Right. So that if they'd all got the vote, right. <laughs> they'd have ruled the roost. But they didn't all get the vote uh, until 1928. Nope. But they, there was no risk, of course, that they would all be elected to Parliament, so there was no risk in letting them stand as candidates for Parliament on the same terms as men. That is my theory. However, getting the vote and being able to stand for Parliament uh, led to the next thing, which is the Sex Disqualification Removal Act of 1919, almost as important a centenary next year as this. And that... Uh, provided that a person was not to be disqualified by sex or marriage from the exercise of any public function or from being appointed to or holding any civil or judicial office or post or from entering or assuming or carrying on any civil professional vocation or from admission to any incorporated society. And that meant that women could become lay magistrates. And by 1947, there were about 3,700 women lay magistrates, which is a lot. So Lord Chancellor was not in the slightest bit bothered about appointing women as lay magistrates. But professional judges were another matter. The first women were called to the bar and admitted as solicitors in 1922, but their numbers were very low. Uh, in the 1920s, there were only about eight or nine women a year admitted as solicitors. They got up to an average of 16 in the 1930s. Uh, over the same two decades, it was an average of 13 women were called to the bar. But that's tiny numbers. Um, but it did mean that there were a few who were qualified to hold judicial office. Uh, and the first woman to do so, I wonder how many people know in this room, the first woman to hold judicial office, professional judicial office, was called Sybil Campbell. Did you know that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sybil Campbell was, I'm delighted to say, a Gertonian. 
<laughs> though not a law graduate, uh, but she was appointed a Metropolitan <coughs> Stipendary Magistrate, what we would now call a District Judge, open brackets, Magistrates Court, close brackets, uh, <laughs> but uh, they were called magistrates then, uh, and she was appointed in 1945, and she sat in the Tower Bridge Magistrates Court, so she was dealing with all the crime that came from the London docks, which was quite a lot. Um, and uh, she, she was one of the early women who'd been called to the bar, but she didn't have a huge practice. None, very few of them did. But during the war, she'd been number, Britain's number one food detective, <laughs> tracking down the black marketeers. Um, so she took rather a dim view of um, pilfering food and black marketeering and similar sorts of corruption that came from the docks. Anyway, why was she appointed? She was appointed because the stipendary magistrates, the metropolitan ones, were appointed by the Home Secretary. And the Home Secretary was Herbert Morrison. And he, of course, was determined to appoint a woman uh, to this post. Um, and uh, so he exercised a degree of positive discrimination uh, to choose Sybil Campbell uh, for this first judicial post. Uh, the Lord Chancellor was another matter uh, as well. Uh, her appointment uh, uh, provoked a lot of controversy. Um, they queried whether she was qualified as she'd been a civil servant. Now we hear that today. Can you possibly be a judge if you've been a civil servant or you are a civil servant? Um, did she have the ability to do it, et cetera, et cetera. All of that was a smokescreen to objecting because she was a woman, but they couldn't by then in 1945 do that. Um, however, her lack of court experience may just have shown up because she was notoriously heavy sentencer. Now, we might think that women might be kinder than men. No such thing with Sybil Campbell. Uh, if you read some of her sentencing, it was pretty severe. Um, and there were newspaper and trade union campaigns against her, and even a march uh, of uh, several thousand uh, trade unionists protesting at her heavy sentences. Uh, but there we go. Never mind. She stuck it out, she weathered the storm, and she stayed sitting as a Metropolitan Stipendary Magistrate until she reached uh, the statutory retirement age of 72 in 1961. So I think we ought to know more about Sybil Campbell and celebrate her achievement because it was a great thing. The first woman to sit as a recorder in jury trials was Dorothy Knight Dix, who was appointed a deputy recorder of Deal in 1946. First woman to sit in the county courts was Edith Hesling, who sat as a deputy also in March of that same year. But these were ad hoc part-time appointments, largely uh, in the gift of the judge for whom they were deputizing. So they didn't, in a way, really count. But I suppose it did show that it, you know, it's a bit like women preaching. They can actually do it. You know? yeah. um, so Hilary Heilbronn, Queen's Counsel, is right to claim that her mother, Rose Heilbronn, was the first woman to hold uh, judicial office because she was appointed the full... Well, she wasn't a full-time job, but she was the proper permanent recorder of Burnley in 1956. Now, Rose is a really remarkable woman. Uh, she uh, graduated from Liverpool University with a first-class honours degree in law. Um, so we're very proud of her on the Northern Circuit. Um, uh, she was called to the bar in 1939, and in 1949, she was one of the first two women uh, to become Queen's Counsel. And she definitely deserved it, because by then she had amassed a very substantial practice. And during the 1950s, she was probably the most famous barrister in the country. And she appeared in lots of high-profile uh, criminal uh, trials. Um, but she wasn't the first woman to be appointed a full-time judge. That was Elizabeth Lane, uh, who was appointed uh, a county court judge in 1962. That is the year before I went up to Cambridge to read law. So it's no surprise that when I went up to read law, it never crossed my mind that I'd ever be any sort of judge, because there weren't a lot of them about. Um, things changed. She was promoted to the High Court in 1965, so she became the first woman High Court judge, and nine years later, she was joined by Rose Heilbronn as the second woman High Court judge. But guess what? Although both of them had had very large, substantial Queen's Bench practices, where do you suppose they were put? The family division. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but never mind, uh, they made a success uh, of that. So it took until 1992 for the first woman to be appointed a Queen's Bench judge. These are staggering dates, aren't they? And it's worthwhile that you all remember them, 1992. Uh, and that was Dame Anne Ebsworth, who was the first woman who was regarded as a safe enough pair of hands uh, to become a Queen's Bench Division judge. And 1993, Dame Mary Arden became the first woman Chancery Division uh, judge. Now, these were the days when all judicial appointments depended upon a tap on the shoulder from the Lord Chancellor. Now, I benefited from that. I cannot knock it um, <laughs> in the way that everybody else benefited. But maybe partly because uh, it had reached a point in the early 90s uh, when the Lord Chancellor was on the lookout for appointable women. You know, it, so it was an advantage to be a woman, um, having been a disadvantage for all those years that I've been telling you about. Because <laughs> uh, the politicians knew, as they know now, that the gender imbalance was not acceptable. It was the profession that, and the judiciary generally that was slower to catch up. And, of course, appointments largely depended upon the views of the senior judges and the profession. Well, things have changed a lot since then. I mean, I was appointed in 1994. It's a very long time ago. I have been around almost as long as any other judge because I'm one of the handful who were appointed before the magic date when your retirement age uh, went down to 70. So I can still go on till I'm 75. <laughs> So it's wonderful when I was appointed president of the Supreme Court because a 72-year-old woman replaced a 70-year-old man. <laughs> we, we, have to, we have to be pleased, I suppose, if we're pleased about my appointment, which some of, some of us are. Um, <laughs> We have to be pleased that they changed the accident of the change in the retirement ages meant that I could do that. So it's wonderful. So I've got two years not to mess it up. <laughs> so please, please pray for me. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, but uh, we have, everything has got a lot better since then because we have an open, transparent and politically independent system of judicial appointments. The pace of change has quickened. The High Court and the Court of Appeal are up to one-fifth women. We're celebrating one-fifth. Um, nearly 100 years after women became qualified to become judges. And we're celebrating because it's about double what it was 10 years ago. Just as we're celebrating having two women in the Supreme Court because that's double what it was six months ago. <laughs> But we mustn't knock it. You know, people are actively trying <laughs> to do the right thing uh, and recruit uh, uh, a much more diverse uh, judiciary. Uh, but we have still a long way to go before the numbers of women, especially in the higher ranks of the judiciary, match the numbers of women entering the professions. But don't let it put any of you off going into the profession, those of you who want to. Um, things will be better when you get to um, uh, the, the, the right stage because they're getting better all the time. I happen not to think that the answer lies in positive discrimination. In other words, appointing women because they are women, even though they may not be as good as uh, the men. Um, I, I happen to think that that is not the right solution, uh, partly for the sake of the women themselves, because I have heard too many really good women say, oh, I'm not going to apply because if I get it, people are only going to say that I got it because I was a woman. Now, that is a pernicious thing, and it really mustn't happen. So people have got to be encouraged to apply. Uh, but I am in favour of all sorts of affirmative action. That is looking for talent wherever talent is to be found. And there are loads of really able, sensible women who don't continue in independent practice, either as barristers or solicitors, People like Shami didn't continue an independent practice at the bar. Sensible woman. <laughs> well, yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> we can agree upon that. Uh, because uh, there are better ways of, of, of running your life, really. 
So the government legal service is stuffed with really able women who are trained to speak truth unto power and to give honest, neutral advice. So why aren't we looking there for judges? There's the Crown Prosecution Service, similarly, st stuffed with able women. Why aren't we looking there for judges? There's uh, in-house counsel. There are all the regulators, stuffed full of able women lawyers. Why aren't we looking there, as well as in all the traditional places? And when we look, can we find out the best ways of getting the best people? How do we know how to uh, choose the best people? It's really difficult to know how to choose the best people if they're not like you. Everybody likes and thinks the world of the people who are really quite like them. That's why Chambers, when they had a first woman, quite a lot of sets of Chambers, wondered what they'd got. Because they weren't quite sure how to judge, you know, who would be good and who would not be good. They've got a lot better at it since. But it is a problem uh, of assessing people who don't fit the traditional um, mould. So we have to work at all of those things, recruiting, attracting, assessing. Uh, but if we work hard at that, I have great hope that... Um, oh, and I didn't mention academics and law teachers as well, did I? I mentioned <laughs> loads of able women um, <laughs> academics <laughs> and law teachers. So uh, that's, that's my uh, prescription for continued uh, improvement. Uh, although I know when I hand over to Shami, she will say the reason why we now have so many more women MPs than we had before is uh, quite a lot to do with all women shortlists. So that's a good point at which to hand over to Shami, isn't it? Well, thank you so much, Brenda. That was a, a, a that was fantastic, and I, I you have shamed me of my ignorance of uh, uh, of women who became the first judges and so on, who I've never even heard of, which was terrible. So, thank you very much for that. Education is meant to be, in part, a shaming experience of just that kind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, um, I'm delighted now to, uh, to introduce, um, to welcome uh, Shami uh, to give our next talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. What a daunting privilege to, uh, to follow um, Baroness Hale. If I sound strange, I have a cold. It's not because I'm strange. Is the cold Australian? Is it Italian? That's a whole Brexit question and not, um, not the subject for this evening. So just to be clear, um, we are not celebrating 100 years of votes for women. There have been mixed messages in the media all day. I want to be absolutely clear. That you've, you heard from, from colleagues earlier. This is 100 years of votes for all men aged 21 and over and basically middle class women. Right? It's very, very important, and this airbrushing of history, in my view, holds us back. It's going to be another 10 years before we can celebrate votes for all women, but you wouldn't necessarily know that from some of the hoo-ha in the press. Now, I don't say this to be the Grim Reaper, but that's what my teenage son calls me. Um, <laughs> I say this because I think it's quite important. As you've heard from Baroness Hale, um, um, the franchise was, was well, I, these are my words now, deliberately excluded from working class women in 1918. Um, why was that the case? I think it's important to explore that just for a moment. Um, I, to some extent, agree with her theory that it was a numbers game. Because remember, we've just had the, the Great War, the First World War, and the numbers of men, um, young men in particular, have been very sorely depleted by that horrific war. And if you'd granted the vote to all women, women would have been in the majority. And so all those arguments that are now applied against votes at 16 and 17, which I support, by the way, brains aren't big enough, not clever enough, too easily impressioned by those around them were, were being applied to, to women. So that, that's part of the prejudice and part of the problem. Um, I think it was thought that middle class women would be more likely to be safe Tory voters. 
And actually, that proved to be the case in the early years of women's votes. Let's, you know, that is a matter of historical fact. Um, this was a suffrage that was grudgingly given. And I say that because anything important in the world of human rights is hard won. Wasn't won by asking nicely. It was won by brave, brave feminists, braver perhaps than most of us, being dragged off to prison and force-fed periodically by right-wing governments. And I think it's important to, amongst the celebrations, also remember the courage of those suffragettes. And for me, it is the suffragettes most of all who I remember, because that was the sacrifice that they made. And many of them, if they didn't die in the moment, died prematurely as a result of that torture at the hands of the British state and sanctioned by British governments. And therefore, I remember that law, you know, we, we're here united in a belief in the rule of law and in law as an empowering, wonderful, precious thing. But when it's unjust law, it can also hold people back and it can prop up tyranny as the Cat and Mouse Act, as it was euphemistically called, propped up tyranny in those days that led up to the 1918 Act. And that's why, yes, there was direct action and, and the suffragettes broke that law. Now, whether you would do it, whether I would do it, that's a matter for individual ethical decision. But I certainly find it very hard to, to judge the Pankhursts, uh, and I find it hard to judge Nelson Mandela for his conviction for sabotage of the apartheid state. And guess what, for me, the analogy stands. As I, as I will suggest why in, in a moment. So why was the vote actually given first to all men and 10 years later to all men if it was given so grudgingly? It was given for fear of social unrest. It was given for fear of revolution. If you look at what was happening post-World War I elsewhere in the world. But the lessons of that period in history for me are also that feminism without wider campaigning for social justice will always be for the few and not the many. And the analogy today would be with certain niche arguments and campaigns that are always about women, I don't know, women in parliament or women in the boardroom and women even in the judiciary, dare I say it, and not about women on zero hours contracts as if the debate is always about women sitting, more women, and they should, by the way, sit at top tables of, of power and authority, but what about the women serving at those tables, cleaning those tables, building those tables? For me, this isn't a narrow civil liberties issue. This is also social and economic and cannot be separated from your wider politics um, because it is a fundamentally political issue um, for me. And the oldest trick in the book is divide and rule. And that is why working class women who had done the graft and made the bullets during the Great War were the ones left out of the franchise and middle class and aristocratic women benefited. Divide and rule. So, so working class women to some extent were let down both by their feminist sisters but to some extent by some of their brothers in the labour movement who they've made common cause with but not to the point of that movement insisting that everyone was going to get the vote together. That doesn't mean that I don't celebrate that first, that first step towards ultimate success 10 years later. I just think there are lessons to be learnt about divide and rule of campaigns for social justice even today. I want to, um, to briefly, if I may, read from a little book that I wrote called Of Women in the 21st Century, which is, which is my kind of modern socialist feminist polemic. Um, and in that book, as, as, as Baroness Hale has suggested, I do, I think, disagree with her a little bit about positive discrimination in in, um, in places like the judiciary. I don't think there's a magic answer to this, but this, um, this middle-aged woman is getting a little impatient for change. I do think the case of all women shortlists in the Labour Party is worth looking at because it's, it's led to an exponential 
um, growth, not just in the number of women um, in the Parliamentary Labour Party, but in Parliament altogether. And we now have um, a gender balanced shadow cabinet, and we have more women in the Parliamentary Labour Party than all the other women MPs combined. And if we keep going for a bit longer, as we intend to do, we are on course for 50% of the Parliamentary Labour Party um, at the next, after the next general election. I think that's significant. And, and I would just say that this argument that the danger, I do understand the danger um, of if women are, um, are benefited by positive discrimination, people won't take them seriously. But, but almost as Baroness Hale suggested in her anecdote, that's a problem anyway. When I first started appearing on news programs on a regular basis, people would say to me, well, firstly, they'd say, you're on question time every week, when I'd been on once a year for three years. <laughs> no, seriously, and, and there's been research on this, that if you look at a crowd scene in a nice period movie, like, I don't know, Suffragette, no, if you, if you, if you look at the movies, people think that women are much more present than they really are because our eyes and our ears have become so, in, so attuned to a male norm that one woman out of 10 looks like 50%. So there's, there's an issue there. But people used to say to me, um, you're on every week when I was on once a year. And they also used to say, aren't you worried about being a token? Why do they have you on all the time? It must be because you're a black woman. And maybe I used to worry about, about that a little bit once, but not now. Um, now I think not so much a token as a beacon. And you know, in the end, the status quo is not meritocratic. Now, you know, I'm not going to spare Lady Hale's blushes. She's not just the first, and for a long time, she was the only woman in our highest court until she, you know, managed by a miracle to persuade people to have a second woman, which is wonderful. But she's also an absolutely brilliant lawyer. And I don't think we measure equality and social justice in society by the most brilliant alone. Because I'm afraid that for many, many years and centuries, we've been doing reasonably well in this country with a lot of mediocre men in very senior seats of power. <laughs> believe in the rule of law as I suspect everybody in a room like this on an evening like this ultimately does you will worry about the legitimacy and the public trust in an institution as important as the senior judiciary just as you do in a different kind of legitimacy for the polity and it's just too easy for certain newspapers you know which ones I'm talking about every time there is a judgment that they don't like to show the parade of all the white men in full-bottomed wigs. Now, they might be the most brilliant men on the planet, but it's too, too easy for not the enemies of the people, but the enemies of the rule of law to do down a vital, a vital in in institution because of that, that very simple lack of, um, of demographic, if not um, democratic, representation. So just briefly from my introduction to my book. Um, <laughs> Imagine a Martian falls to Earth tonight. Let's say Martians are sexless and completely unaccustomed to sexual or gender-based difference on their own planet. Our alien friend could arrive absolutely anywhere in our world, on any continent, in a rich, poor, urban or ru rural environment. What difference, discrimination or oppression, would they notice everywhere and most of all? Surely, they couldn't fail to observe that roughly half the race is overtly diminished in a way that diminishes the other half in a manner that's perhaps more subtle, but nonetheless real. <coughs> Look at the suicide rates of young men in particular. Look at them all over the world, in and out of war, crime, and incarceration. Look at your kind, clever, and gentle sons, brothers, husbands, and lovers, and the pressures that can make them become the closed and invulnerable bullies who first bullied them. Wasted potential, lost happiness, wasted life. I don't want to call the glass half empty, but the pace of its filling is certainly too slow. <laughs> 
20 years ago, I thought we were in inevitable positive transition, fresh from the comfort and confidence of a completely free and relatively egalitarian state higher education. I had all the time in the world and thought I wouldn't need it. Now, I'm not so sure, at least in the short term. I had so much faith in my generation of similarly educated young men and women who shared classes, books and dreams, but grew up to betray each other and themselves with crunched credit, illegal wars and a more unequal world of our own making. What would a Pankhurst or de Beauvoir make of my generation of feminists? No doubt there would be some cause for celebration, but the festivities would surely be muted. Women vote, fight, and own property and power in many parts of the world, but whether by hook or by crook, an unbowed misogynist took the keys to the White House from a woman who once seemed a near inevitable first leader of the free world. And in so many places, women learn, earn, influence, and govern less, and suffer more, whether from the petty but dehumanizing indignities of casual objectification and discrimination, or from the emotional and physical violence that dulls and even snuffs out so many of their lives too soon. Gender injustice may be the greatest human rights abuse on the planet. It blights first and developing worlds, rich and poor women, in the context of health, wealth, education, representation, opportunity, and security everywhere. It is no exaggeration to describe it as an apartheid, but not limited to one country or historical period. For this ancient and continuing wrong is millennial in duration and global in reach. <coughs> Only radical solutions can even scratch its surface. However, the prize is a great one because of the enormous collateral benefits to peace, prosperity, sustainability, and general human happiness. All this because we are all interconnected and all men are of women too. Thanks for listening. Well, Shami, you had absolutely everybody's attention there. You could have heard a pin drop despite the numbers in this, in this theatre. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. And I'd like to invite our final speaker, Professor Nicola Lacey. Well, I think that we can all agree that I've got the hardest job. <laughs> so I'm counting on you all to be on my side and can I just start by saying that it's not only wonderful to see so many of you here and such a diverse audience but it's also really moving so thank you all for being here. Um, now I'm going to really follow on from what Shami was saying and I'm going to actually just show you some, I'm, I'm standing up here because I've got some slides and they're not, don't worry I'm not going to give you a PowerPoint lecture, <laughs> um, but I've just got some of the data that in a sense backs up some of the points that, that both uh, Baroness Hale and Chami Chakrabarti have been making. And, and I want to start by just acknowledging that, of course, the centenary that we're uh, celebrating today, it, it was a very, very partial victory. And as Chami has pointed out, it was, uh, it was mixed in its motives. The, the record shows that keeping a sort of demographic balance and not having a huge shift, if it, I mean, actually, the electorate tripled <coughs> For that election. So it was a huge, huge change. And giving the vote to working to middle class women, basically women of 30 and over with a property qualification, modified the class effect of universal suffrage for men. And unfortunately, we have to acknowledge that that was part of how women uh, began to get the vote. Um, so, so, that, so that's a, a sort of sad thing. And so it raises the question, should we basically be, have reconvened in 10 years' time? Well, we definitely should reconvene in 10 years' time, which, of course, is the date when women finally got universal suffrage. But um, I want to nonetheless suggest that we should be celebrating tonight. 
And we should be celebrating both because 1918 was a real landmark and a legal landmark, which makes it very appropriate that we're celebrating right here. Also, by the way, very, very close to where the, uh, the suffragettes had their headquarters, first on, I think, on 40, uh, 42 Kingsway, just behind this building. I always get confused which direction I'm in when I'm in the basement, but you know, you know where Kingsway is. And then actually nearer what we rather ominously call the towers on the LSE campus. So we're, we're in exactly the right place. And the Women's Library here has this marvelous collection of photos which you can access free on Flickr, uh, which has quite a few wonderful photos of the movement in this particular area of London. So it was a real landmark, um, and it was part of a revolution, but it was what Juliet Mitchell, one of the, the really sort of influential and persuasive voices of the second uh, wave women's movement, described as women, the longest revolution. So it wasn't the first bit of that revolution, it was uh, really part of a very long development, which certainly is not finished yet, for reasons I will try to persuade you of, those of you, which probably isn't very many, who need to be persuaded. So let's start with the things to celebrate. These are, this is just a sort of selection of some of the major, major uh, legal and political victories for women's social and uh, political and civil rights which have had some, also some implications for their social and economic position. So we have, of course, it starts way before 1918. Uh, a, a good landmark would be the Married Women's Property Act, uh, which extended property right, rights for married women in 1870. Then we have what we're celebrating tonight. Um, then you begin to see the dismantling of what I'd like to think of as the restrictive practices that men had maintained in the professions. Um, then we have the Law Property Act, which starts to chip away at inheritance differences. Um, finally, we get full suffrage, full formal women's uh, citizenship in 1928. Um, then Married Women's Property Act uh, goes further the Abortion Act, the availability of the contraceptive pill, Equal Pay Act, 1970, um, Matrimonial Causes Act, and of course Baroness Hale has been a very important uh, um, figure in the reform of family law, a hugely important issue uh, for women. <coughs> Sex Discrimination Act, 1975. Thank you, membership of the EU, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, the Equal Pay Act was actually on the legislature book for some time before it was implemented, and it was really our accession to the EU that got us there, and we'll come back to that. Uh, Domestic Violence and Matrimonial Proceedings Act, 1976. Uh, equal Pay Amendment Act, again, thank you EU, equal pay doesn't just mean equal pay for like work, hopeless principle in a segregated labour market, uh, but equal pay for work of equal value, even if you have to compare yourself to somebody who does something slightly different. Um, statutory maternity pay, 1986, and Finally, the abolition of the marital rape exemption, a mere 1991. So these are genuine things to celebrate, and I'm not in any way minimising that. Um, and of course, these things did make a difference to women's material position as well as their formal legal position. So here are a couple more optimistic slides. So this is what's happened to women's labour force participation uh, across well, actually going right back to the middle of the 19th century, and you can see that the really amazing story is the second half of the 20th century. Not very much changes, and in fact, if, if this was more graduated, you would see war effects and that sort of thing. But essentially, the big, big change happens after the Second World War, and it just goes on going up. And then, something close to our hearts, of course, here at the LSE, as in any university, uh, women's uh, ch the change in women's representation in higher education. And this is really extraordinary, because if you look even just back to the 1980s and 1990s, you can see that, that women were really, really a, a very small minority. And yet today, actually, in many categories, women have numerically overtaken 
overtaken men in higher education. So these are important effects of some of those legal landmarks. So have the main battles been won? Have even the main legal battles been won? Well, I'd like to suggest, really, that even in terms of the law in the books, as we say, the sort of formal law, things like those statutes, um, we have to keep very attentive. And, of course, the current uncertainty about the future of various rights uh, originally brought in through EU law or guaranteed by the EU Charter are, is a major concern, not to mention the uh, accompanying uh, sort of disinformation about the European Convention of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, the impact of the Human Rights Act, uh, all in very toxically mixed up and very inaccurately, in a way, mixed up with the debate about Brexit. Um, so even just in terms of hanging on to what we've got formally, the battle is not over, I would suggest. But of course, those headline gains, victories for equality that we see in, those, in that timeline, my first slide, um, are, are really just a tiny part of the picture. Because as anybody who's uh, thought about the law in action, the socio-legal uh, side of our profession as legal academics knows that what the law says is not always what the law does or what, how the law is enforced or implemented or even if it is for enforced and implemented, it's not always the, uh, the uh, what it says on the tin, if I can put it colloquially. So the Equal Pay Act did not magically overnight, of course, produce equal pay. And so I want to just in the rest of my my. my next sort of five or six minutes, just talk about some of the changes that have happened and some of the changes that haven't happened that we might have expected um, from a socio-legal point of view looking at, uh, at figures. Now, I thought it would be wrong to meet tonight without actually having a visual image of one of the very, very courageous women who, who brought about the, uh, the events that we are celebrating this evening. Um, the, work, the, the suffrage movement was, of course, split between a, a self-proclaimed law-abiding wing and the suffragettes who were militant and had the courage to take their campaign into uh, civil disobedience. And we don't know, actually, whether this woman was a suffragette, but this is from the first decade of the 20th century. What we do know is that she is staring out of a... Uh, um, you can see the bars on the window. She's in Holloway where many of the suffragettes were imprisoned and force-fed. And um, she is looking out through a broken window, and the window has been broken in a suffragette protest. So she symbolizes the, the courage, uh, the civil disobedience, and the state power that Shami was talking about, which has been in integral to this long struggle for women's equality. She's in prison, and I'm going to, to try to stay in celebratory mode as long as possible, show you a few slides that show you one thing that we might have expected to change that hasn't changed very much, and that is women's representation in the various bits of the criminal justice system. So here's the prison population, and as you'll see, actually uh, judged on various measures, um, women prisoners make up a smaller proportion of the prison population today than they did at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, of course, the figures in the early part of the century were swollen by the imprisonment of suffragettes. But um, nonetheless, if you take on board that most criminologists will tell you that what shapes levels of crime has to do with opportunity, on the one hand, and levels of different kinds of social control on another. The fact that the prison population hasn't changed all that much, in fact, women's representation has essentially gone down, is, is really quite interesting and, and maybe puzzling. And if we look at figures on crime, they're actually relatively similar. So here is women in violent crime, very, very small numbers we're talking about here. Here are property offences, 
gone up a little bit, but it's still really a, a, a very distinct minority. And here is overall indictable, the more serious offences, actually women's representation lower than at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, nobody in their right mind would see having a higher proportion or a more equal distribution of women and men in prison or among the crime statistics as being a sensible index of women's progress. Of course they wouldn't. On the other hand, I think given that as that timeline suggested, women's opportunities have grown in terms that we could describe as a sort of quite revolutionary, a quiet revolution, but a revolution nonetheless. It's very striking that this important social phenomenon hasn't changed perhaps as much as we might have expected. So perhaps that's a salutary inequality, but we might want to ask ourselves what the broader forces, particularly the social control forces, are the forms of informal as well as formal state legal discipline uh, which underpin these figures. But let's move to some of the more important um, figure, uh, areas in which we might have expected to see change. And here I'm going to really follow on and just give you some of the, the facts behind uh, the points that uh, Shami was making. So I think that for me here, the headline figure is that 3% women MPs in 1979. Now, as a left-wing feminist who's old enough to remember the 1979 election, I remember it very, very vividly because it was a very sort of confusing and bitter moment for me in many ways because it was the election of the first pro woman prime minister but with a government that had, you know, did not have women's interests really. Uh, well, I think that's fair enough to say. It's nowhere near its, its, uh, its heart if it had a heart. Um, <laughs> and, sorry, that wasn't scripted. Don't minute that, please. Um, so, you know, 3%. I was a student up the road at UCL. Don't minute that either. Um, in 1979. 1987, it goes up to 6.3, 92, 9.2, 97. And this is really Shami's point about all women's shortlists. It goes up to 18 and 19, and then 2017, 32%. Still not where I personally would like it to be. Um, but the really decisive change does, in fact, come with all women sh with uh, women's shortlists in the Labour Party. And um, I think that's a really salutary lesson for us. Um, I share some of Brenda's worries about the impact on the, uh, the general debates and the, the confidence of women uh, from the sort of fact chat that comes with any kind of affirmative action. But having been myself, and I'll just give you one little anecdote. When I was um, 26 in 1984, I, was, um, I got a job at, at New College in Oxford. Jeremy and I became colleagues shortly thereafter. And um, I was the only woman on the fellowship. And there were only two women in former men's colleges in the whole law faculty. And, and it was a very interesting time. I got to know a lot of very, very interesting and brilliant women during that time. But it was very, very hard feeling so different from everybody else. Um, and I was constantly being asked. I mean, over the next decade while I stayed in that job, I was always being asked, are you not worried that you have been appointed just because you're a woman. And interesting, I think when I look back, I've, I'm very interested by my own reaction. For about the first year or so, it made me feel quite undermined and a bit apologetic. Then I moved into the angry phase. <laughs> and we're definitely not going to minute what I thought about that. And then I moved into the, I've got to deal with this strategic phase, and that took about 18 months, where I used to say, not really, because if they have, they can't be disappointed, can they? <laughs> and it would take people a little moment to realize that that was just my way of saying, don't be so insulting. Um, so, I, you know, I do think this happens anyway, even in 
meritocratic systems and I think also that the point and I'm sure that we all three agree about this actually the point that criteria of merit are themselves heavily culturally loaded and gendered uh, is something that we are still really very very much having to tackle so let me move to just on data one more um, one more uh, data point in a way, which is something that's been hugely in the news, as you all, all know, thanks to uh, Auntie, as it were, but it turns out that Auntie is actually should have always have been called Uncle, <laughs> the BBC. Uh, this is the gender pay gap taken for uh, this year, Office of National Statistics, and you can see it's really still quite substantial. Um, of course, this is just a sort of very broad generalization across the labor market, and it probably excludes lots of low-paid work that don't feature in the, um, in the <coughs> formal labor market, the so-called hidden economy, uh, which almost certainly uh, includes lots of kinds of care work uh, that uh, in, it, it disproportionately uh, it features women. Um, this is slightly older data, it's from the Women's Budget Group, um, and uh, here you'll see that there's a huge difference between the public and the private sector. And um, already in 2013, of course, the move to flexibilise zero hours type employment will have been showing up here, uh, and the gender pay gap is just one small part uh, of the impact of that huge structural change in the labour market. Um, if I tell you, we had, and I, I, th I thought I'd got the link on the slide, but I somehow it's been edited out in the very beautiful representation of the slides, which was done by somebody much more skilled than me. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, we had across the law department and the government department and the Gender Institute at LSE a commission on gender inequality and power, which is freely available if you just do LSE Gender Inequality and Power Commission has loads of this sort of data in it. Um, but one of the things that the economists who were working on the economics part of that report found was that the thing, and this comes back to Shami's point about the economic context being so important to the meaning of women's rights. Um, of all the new labor era, which reform had the biggest impact on women, would you say, on women's economic position? It was the minimum wage, exactly. So it was the minimum wage, for anybody who couldn't hear this very well-informed uh, member of the audience, um, and so sometimes the things that most benefit women are not things that are targeted specifically at women, but that's also a reminder, why did the minimum wage help women so much because they were disproportionately <coughs> at the bottom end of the pay sector. So these global figures on the gender pay gap are hiding that huge disparity qualitatively across the group. So I've just mentioned uh, really some of the headlines. Of course, there are many, many other pressing issues that have a disproportionate concern for women, impact on women, violence against women <coughs> is one of the current headlines, closely related access to justice and the diminishing access to justice for uh, women uh, on the receiving end of violence of various kinds, but also employment discrimination. Uh, happily, the Supreme Court has rolled back on that somewhat in terms of tribunal fees, but just as the minimum wage disproportionately helped women, austerity has disproportionately affected women and other other less uh, economically advantaged groups. So we must celebrate tonight, but we mustn't stop fighting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nikki, and I am sure you will all agree with me that the last hour has been an education in the very best sense that the LSE has to offer. It really has. So I, I, I'm delighted by uh, what I've heard, and I'm sure you are all too. Now, um, we do have, um, I, I'm sure you're, 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 some of your stomachs may be rumbling, some of you may be feeling it's wine o'clock or uh, uh, whatever it may be. <laughs> in fact, it's some time past wine o'clock, actually. But, um, but nonetheless, what, what I'm going to do is to, I'm going to take a couple of questions in turn for each uh, speaker and hopefully that will be all right. Uh, could I remind you of course of our traditions of uh, civilized 
uh, and tolerant question and answer um, in this auditorium. Um, so first of all, would anyone like to ask, uh, or, or a couple of people, uh, who would like to ask a question to uh, Baroness Hale? I think we have a, a roving mic. If you want to stick your hand up and catch your eye, there's a gentleman over there. Um, who else would like to ask a question to Baroness Hale? Uh, and yes, uh, you, you there. So th those are our two questions. Could I ask you to um, uh, not, not to preface your question with too much uh, 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 background, but um, I will leave it up to you. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, I'm a man, so hear me out, please. <laughs> um, first, just a comment. If anybody wants to embarrass, indeed humiliate, the director of law at the LSE, all they need do is sign up to the First 100 Years campaign, which will tell them all about the progress of women in the law and tell them all about those judges about whom um, at least one professor doesn't seem to know very much. The question is really, and I'll be interested in Shami's answer uh, to this question too. There have been two models put forward, there may be many more, for how there could be appointments of women to the higher echelons of the judiciary. One of them was the idea of looking further afield, and the other one is p potentially to learn in some way from all women's shortlists. Um, if there's one thing that all those legislation, um, those pieces of legislation showed, it's that ultimately <coughs> political will is required. And at the moment, appointments by, uh, of judges are not made by politicians. They're made by a committee which is supposed to be independent and therefore to appoint only the best people. Um, but one way forward might be um, to resolve the concern that's been considered by all the panellists, which is that after appointment, a particular appointee might feel that they've only got the job for the wrong reason. That you use the current appointments committee to identify who are the people who are qualified for the role, and it then becomes a political decision for the Lord Chancellor to appoint from that people so as to enable diversity and equality considerations to be taken properly into account. If that were to happen in that way, no judge could be made to feel that she or he was not good enough. They would have been stated to be good enough by the panel at the first stage. But it would enable someone who actually wanted to bring about something like equality to do it. And at the present, no politician can. <laughs> um, shall, shall we take the second question and then um, uh, uh, then we can hear what the, then we can hear the, the answers to the two at the same time? Yes, Baroness Hale. My question is much simpler. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of looking af um, further afield, in terms of looking at female lawyers who are maybe not just purely an independent practice. Um, for myself, I'm particularly drawn to a balance of practice and academic practice. I know that's your background. How do you think it is best to balance that for those of us who maybe don't want to be purely 100% in professional practice? Mm. Well, they're both very interesting questions, as always. Can I deal with the... Uh, uh, greater political involvement in appointments. Because, of course, that is the system in a lot of places. Um, in Canada, for example, they do have merit-based commissions, who, but they put up three candidates, shall we say, for the post, and then the choice is made by the politician. Um, and there are, there's a lot to be said for that sort of system. Uh, I made the very modest suggestion that you could have politicians involved in the appointing commissions at the highest level, one from the government and one from the opposition, so that you had people who were politically aware, who were conscious of the, the um, sort of public pressures, uh, but not... Uh, because it was party politically balanced, you would be bringing something, you'd be also getting a greater democratic buy-in to the judiciary, because now we've got this problem of brilliantly independent merit-based selection, 
but the politicians know nothing about it, don't feel that they've got a, a stake in it. Uh, and that could be thought to be a problem um, with, the, uh, with the general understanding of the judiciary and the general um, legitimacy uh, as felt from the outside. We, we feel we're legitimate, but other people have to feel we're legitimate too. So I made this as a modest proposal, as a uh, really small change from our present system towards uh, greater political involvement. I was absolutely slated by the bar, which um, uh, debated my proposal at the bar conference and threw it out with no uncertain terms. So the present climate amongst the judiciary and the legal profession is very much against uh, increasing the political involvement and giving the politicians more choice. Uh, that's what I can say uh, about that. Um, there are numerous ways of appointing the judiciary and there is no really ideal one. <laughs> the one thing one can probably say is that electing them is not a very good idea. <laughs> um, but I'm quoting Ruth Bader Ginsburg for that um, uh, proposition. Now, as far as balancing practice and academia, uh, that's now much harder than it was when I was your age. Um, because I was able to uh, get a job teaching at Manchester University straight after graduating from Cambridge because they were on the lookout. You know, there, there was a shortage of people going into academic law at that stage. Um, and I was able to study for the bar in my garret with a self-tuition correspondence course, uh, which cost me hardly anything. Um, uh, so I passed the bar finals. I then had to eat all these dinners, uh, which is why it took me two years to qualify as a barrister. But I could do both. And I could then practice as a barrister at the Manchester Bar uh, for a few years until, in fact, you couldn't do both because uh, these inconvenient things called students got in the way of the clients, and the inconvenient things called clients got away in the students. So, you know, you had to choose one or the other if you wanted to make progress in either. But at least I could start out doing both. And that now is really difficult because you don't get an academic job without postgraduate degree or degrees. Uh, and qualifying for either branch of the profession, but particularly the bar, costs an arm and a leg. Uh, and a full time uh, course, or at least mainly, it's not, it doesn't invariably have to be full time, but certainly a lot of time uh, is spent. So it's much harder to do, which I regret. I regret it because I think it's good for universities to have some people who have some contact with the world of, of, of the law as it is outside. Um, and it's good for uh, the practitioners to have a little bit of acquaintance with um, how people think about the law um, rather than this intensely practical thing. <laughs> And of course, as far as being a judge, I think the combination of knowing how things work on the ground, but also having the more synoptic view of, of how the law works and the, the more, not necessarily theoretical, there are many different kinds of academic lawyers, but certainly uh, a standing back from the everyday. Uh, these are good things. I don't have any answers to that, but I, you know, if you can manage to do it, good on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, those are two excellent questions. Thank you very much. Now, could I take two for uh, Shami, please? Yes, there's a, 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 a lady right at the back and a gentleman right at the back. Okay. Um, thank you for your talk, Shami. Um, I have to contest the idea that all women shortlists are the solution. You know, I won't reveal my own political sympathies, but essentially in the Labour Party, women shortlists were used to keep out left-wing candidates who were selected by local parties. Uh, Harriet Harman was all in favour of uh, all women shortlists. She does not reveal the fact that that shortlist was suspended for her husband, Jack Dromey, uh, uh, and he was selected in spite of the opposition of, the, of his local CLP. Now, the fact is that at one time in Parliament, there were more 
MPs called John than women of all parties put together. Uh, thankfully, we, we've gone away from that. But all women shortlists are not the solution because it's, in fact, the mechanism used by the leadership to control the party uh, membership. You know, it's called the iron law of oligarchy. It has never changed, it will never change. And essentially, if we want real democracy in any party, whether it's called the A-list or whatever, we have to allow the membership to choose the candidates. Thankfully, that is now being rectified by, by uh, uh, recent events within uh, other parties. Uh, I, I would say that essentially, it may have a symbolic value, it may have a declaratory value, but it's not necessarily democratic. Okay, and our second question. Okay. Hello. Yes, uh, if you could ask your question and then we can have um, the answers uh, uh, following hi, that. Hi, Shami. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask, so thanks to All Women Shortlist, we now have a great, much greater number of women in Parliament, which is good to see. So I'm curious as to whether you think uh, that intersectionality is going to be the next big thing, by which I mean um, women who experience multiple discriminations and where you think the direction of travel is around that. Um, so perhaps I can okay. elude, uh, el oh, elude, el elide the first question put to me to the original question that was also offered to me. Um, so to go back to the original questioner, um, I don't think there's necessarily a conflict between the looking further afield and, for example, recruiting directly to the judiciary from the academy and um, some form of positive discrimination. I think there's a, a pick and mix potentially of options. And, uh, and by the way, I don't consider there to be a completely right or wrong answer to this. Mm -hmm. And where one does experiment with affirmative action and even positive discrimination, it could be just that, an experiment <coughs> that is time limited. And that's sort of the approach adopted by CERD. Nobody wants um, a world where we have to have quotas for everything forever. That's not what we're trying to achieve. What we're trying to do is to kickstart change from a status quo that is so discriminatory and the discrimination is so entrenched that I'm prepared to use the A word, and, and I am. Um, so there's no magic correct answer, but I do think you could, you know, you could look at a sort of um, a range of ingredients. I'm not instinctively for greater political involvement, certainly not elected, certainly we don't want an elected um, judiciary. If you have elected judges, Barabbas always goes free, I think. Um, there is, you know, there is, there's a reason why you want a, an independent judiciary. You want, you know, you want a judge who can rule in something like the Belmarsh case when people are understandably terrified of terrorism, and that's not necessarily going to be an elected political judge. So I think it's important to to remember that vital importance of independence. But but where, um, but you getting toasted by the bar council, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, I'm surprised at that, um, because you weren't saying there should be political appointments. You were suggesting some involvement. Um, it's as I say, I don't think there's a right and wrong answer to this, but I do think there's been a little complacency, if I'm honest. In parts, in parts of the profession and parts of the judiciary. And I say that, I hope, as a proven friend of both the judiciary and the profession, when it hasn't always been fashionable or popular to, to, to take that view. I say it as someone who acknowledges in my book, for example, that it was judges, including posh um, white male judges like your former colleague Simon Brown, who abolished um, um, you know, marital rape, um, when we'd already had a woman prime minister for over a decade, you know. So, so make no mistake. Of course, a man can do justice to a woman, um, and, and, and of course, judges should be should be independent. But we do, I think, need to improve the demographic legitimacy of not just the judiciary, but um, higher. Uh, higher seats of corporate governance and, and other institutions. And elsewhere in the workforce, I think that there uh, can be a place for, for experimenting with affirmative action the other way. So for example, primary education is very overly feminized in this country. And I think a lot of little boys and a lot of little girls might actually benefit from, um, from the possibility of a head teacher saying, we really need some more young men teaching 
um, these kids. Many of them are fatherless or, or don't have enough positive male role models. And it, I think sometimes it, there should be a possibility of doing this, and sometimes the situation is so serious that it should be a requirement. But this is not, this is not very black and white. It, you have to make equality a positive goal and then to some extent experiment. Uh, on a time limited basis with some ways forward. And on all women shortlist, of course um, a mechanism like positive discrimination could be could be manipulated to impose candidates uh, um, on on local constituencies from the centre. But that can be done by all sorts of uh, mechanisms. Uh, I don't I, I don't support that. I do think that, that, that the broader democracy is important. But you can say there will be all women shortlists in some of the most winnable seats and then let the local constituency select from a shortlist of people who apply there are you know there are things you can do to counter this idea that it's a that it's a suspect thing but in the end you know th these men have to give up a little bit of privilege and power for there to be equality and that's whether it's in politics or whether it's in the professions or whether i'm afraid it's in the judiciary intersectionality is so important because um, and, and it's you know it's it's the word of, of of the moment, and you know you can use other words like multiple discrimination, multiple identity. I think multiple identity is the truth, by the way, of the human experience. You know, we're a group of we're a sort of mixed audience here. We've got probably on balance more women than men. Some of us may be lawyers or law students. Others may be you know from all, we have all different ways of describing ourselves, and how we describe ourselves in a particular moment might be a combination of the most recent experience or the strongest experience or, or who we 're trapped in a, a lift with. Um, I think it 's very dangerous for feminism if it 's too often portrayed or perceived as an elite woman 's sport as just being about the boardroom all the executives who are already getting paid 200 grand instead of 500 grand. Now, I do think that inequality b uh, between the sexes is wrong per se, but I want to see transparency at the BBC, not just in relation to the highest paid talent. I want to see it all the way down. And I want, by the way, to see um, state enforcement um, powers in relation to um, gender equality, because as Nikki reminded us we've had an equal pay act since 1970 and yet we do not have equal pay why is that right so you know the inland revenue will inspect whether you are paying your taxes but there's no state agency that inspects whether you are paying men and women fairly and equally and is it right that it should be left to individual women whether they're Carrie Grace or whether they're some poor woman working for a supermarket to take on the Leviathan individually and go to the tribunal I think that's completely unrealistic and we need to do something about that And we have, uh, we, we have time for a couple of questions for, for Nikki. If anyone uh, wants to put up their hand, there's a gentleman oh. there and a lady uh, um, almost parallel. Yes, keep your hand up and then, yeah. Thank you. Um, we heard some quite interesting and insightful thoughts on the possible motives behind the 1918 Act. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on if the 1918 Act hadn't happened, would the 1928 Act have happened earlier or later? Thank you. Great question. Um, I don't know if this is a question specifically for Professor Lacey or for all the panel. I'm a barrister in independent practice, and in my experience and that of uh, many women I know, the inequality between men and women, both in representation and in pay, actually kicks in when you have children. When you're younger, you don't have dependents, um, you can pretty much remain parallel with men, in my experience, both in pay and in achievement. Stop to have a child, however, and the game changes. Now, the, this is acknowledged somewhat, but it's mainly uh, framed in terms of there should be better childcare. What about those women like me who want to take time out to look after their child rather than simply say, well, we need better childcare 
Um, does the panel think this is something that has to be a cultural change first in how we view primary caregivers uh, and childcare generally, or is this something that is better dealt with by the law first, for example, in terms of giving men and women uh, much longer uh, time out as parents? Or is it something that the law needs to deal with, or is it something that will only change uh, through a cultural change? Well, thank you for those two excellent questions. Um, to your question, um, I'm afraid I'm simply going to have to say I wish I was a good enough historian of the 1920s and of the, the women's movement at that stage to, to hazard a guess about the answer to that very fascinating counterfactual. Um, I, I, I just don't know enough about that period. My instinct is to say that the symbolic change to the suffrage for some women was, a, was pretty important and gave the sense that the battle could be won for votes. But I don't know enough, frankly, about how the, the, the pressure built up. I'm afraid my reading for this, this lecture was restricted to the 1918 Act. Um, and it's a while since I read that history. Shami might be able to help further. Uh, <laughs> she said, <laughs> your new best friend. Um, so uh, this, this question, you're, of course, absolutely right, and I should have mentioned that when I talked about the gender pay gap. One of the differences that my charts even out is the age and parenting one. And in fact, if you look at the charts, the commission, we've got an interesting one that shows that there's, there's really a, actually a relatively minimal pay gap now until, uh, until the first child is born. My feeling about this, honestly, is that there is some role for law. One of the things that we uh, recommended in the commission was that we look much more closely at the legal position in Norway where parental leave has to be shared between the parents. But I think the much bigger battle, which really has to do with the culture of organisations, is in how work is organised, but both the whole question about how much we should all be working and how care is distributed more generally, but the culture of organisations and how they distribute work and how they regard job sharing. Uh, I don't mean just formal job sharing, but working in teams. And I, I spent, in the year after the Commission reported, I went around talking to a lot of pressure groups, all, particularly in the, I got a lot of invitations from the city, which was interesting to me, and the, the main message I got from women working in top law firms or, you know, law firms doing a lot of international commercial work and, and investment banks was that their perception was that it was very convenient for management having a lot, certain portion of the workforce, as it were, define itself out of the competition for partnership or for the very, very senior positions uh, because it helped manage what was inevitably going to be a bottleneck. And that's, that's a real question. It's a cultural question. It's a question about still having to win the argument about why this matters in terms of justice as well as efficiency. <laughs> Well, it, um, it just remains to me to say thank you very much indeed for our questioners. I thought those were excellent questions and they brought out uh, equally excellent answers. So could we have one last round of applause? In, uh, 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 one last round of applause for our, uh, our speakers and, of course, for all our visitors from Mulberry School for Girls. And then as you go out, perhaps the top rows could go first so we don't get a gate scrum in the middle. But um, uh, a round of applause then for uh, our speakers.